Good morning. Uh. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. The evidence is going to show that on April 6th of 2021, Dominique Jones, a woman scorned, set a series of events tr that ended in a tragedy and forced Travis Rudolph to act in self-defense. Her rage and jealousy set this entire thing in motion. That's what the evidence is going to show. You're going to hear that in 2021, Travis Rudolph was 26 years old at the time. He lived in Lake Park on 550 Teak Drive with his mother, Linda, and his brother, Daryl, who also goes by DJ Rudolph. You're going to hear that Travis's father was tragically killed several years ago um, while he was working. He was shot at a restaurant. And because of that, his mother, Linda, felt compelled to have security at the home. They bought a door ring bell camera. They bought a security system called a night owl. Um, she was very fearful for her safety as a result of that incident. Her boys were there. They lived with her. Travis bought some firearms as a result of that for home protection. You're going to hear that he had a concealed weapons permit, that all the guns he owned were legal. There was nothing illegal about his firearms. He kept them in the home primarily in his bedroom. He went to the range, he practiced, he was trained, he knew how to use these firearms and never did. But this night he was forced to in order to save the life of himself and his brother. That's what the evidence is going to show. You're going to hear that on April 6th of 2021, um, well, let me step back for a moment. You've already heard some of this in jury selection that Travis um, went to Cardinal Newman High School. He graduated. He went to FSU on a football scholarship. He was a standout receiver, both at Cardinal Newman and at FSU. Um, you're going to hear that, and you've heard a little bit of this already, that he won the lottery when he got a contract with the NFL. He played with the Giants for a bit, and then he played for the Dolphins. His career with NFL was short-lived, unfortunately. Um, when he was playing for Miami, he sustained a serious in injury. His ACL was torn, and that basically put the end of his NFL career away. But that wasn't the end of it. He still wanted to play ball. That's, that's his passion. He started training and rehabbing down in Miami. He was doing that for quite some time. During the time that he was in the NFL, he also met a woman by the name of Dominique Jones, the woman scorned. And they had been dating for about a year and a half. When he got injured, however, he and Dominique um, started falling out. And they decided that they were um, probably you know, on the outs and they were going to break up. Another reason for that breakup was that Travis had uh, gotten a contract with the Canadian League and was set to leave and go play with them the following month in May of 2021. And Dominique Jones knew that, so they were sort of on the outs. On April 6th, the day of this incident, you're going to hear, and you're going to hear this from <coughs> Travis Rudolph, who's going to take the stand. You're going to hear this whole story from his mouth. You're going to hear that he was down in Miami training, as he had done every day for many, many months. He was down at the NFL facility training with a friend of his who who played on the NFL. He got home late in the afternoon, uh, went home. He and Dominique had been talking, they had been texting, and they decided that they were gonna go to a movie that night. That was their big plan. Uh, they didn't pick out which movie or what time, but it was sometime probably around nine o'clock that evening. Travis remained home, waited for Dominique to come over. You're going to hear that she arrived around seven o'clock or so in the evening. When Dominique arrived there, Linda Rudolph, Travis's mom, was at Bible study at her sister's house. And DJ had just left a little bit before to go to the car wash to get his car detailed. Dominique came into the house, and immediately she told Travis, hey, 
I want to go to the liquor store to get a Patron bottle, a bottle of tequila. They drove to the liquor store. Dominique bought a bottle of Patron, and you're going to hear that they went back to the Rudolph residence. When they got back to the Rudolph's house, they played a card game called Uno. They did a couple of shots of tequila, and you're going to hear this was taking place in Travis's bedroom in the home, and uh, you're going to hear that DJ, Daryl, came home around 8.30 or so. When he got home, he asked Travis to step outside for a moment. He wanted him to look at his detailing of his car. He was dissatisfied with something, and he wanted to ask Travis a question. Travis left his cell phone in his bedroom with Dominique, and he stepped outside. When he came back in, that's when all hell broke loose. Dominique went into his phone without her permission. She sneaked around, scrolled through his text messages, and saw that he had been talking with a woman named Kyla and some other women who were merely friends. But it set her off. She became infuriated, enraged. She lost her mind. She became unhinged. Travis came back into the house. Before he could even do anything, she confronted him. And he said, she's just a friend, Kyla. She could not control her anger, her jealousy, her rage. She lost her mind. She picked up Travis's phone. She FaceTimed Kayla, turned the phone around, and said, talk to her. I want to see, I want to watch your reaction while you talk to this woman. And he did. And he, they were talking as though nothing was wrong, and she could not control her rage. She took the cell phone, smashed it to the ground, and broke it. Screaming, I'm sending my brother over to kill you. I'm sending my brother over to kill you. She then walked over to his dresser, where he had a whole bunch of football trophies and other football things. Picked up a metal trophy, hit him over the head with the trophy in her rage. She then picked up his PlayStation, which was in his room, dragged it to the living room, smashed it there as well in a rage. She was out of control, whole time screaming, I'm sending my brother over to kill you. I'm sending my brother over to kill you. What you're going to hear, though, ironically, is she was married throughout their entire relationship and never told this man this. She was married to a guy named Andre Kishang, or Kishang, I don't know how to pronounce it, but never told him for a year and a half that she was married, sneaking behind her husband's back. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear. You're going to hear that Miss Jones. Sustained. Go ahead. You're going to hear that Miss Jones didn't get a divorce until two months after his arrest. You're going to hear that Dominique was so upset after she smashed his personal items, she storms out of the house. And you're going to see with your own eyes her demeanor, her behavior, what she did, because it's all captured on the ring video camera at the house. You're going to see her storm out of the house. You're going to see with your own eyes her attacking and beating up Travis. Travis is like this. He does nothing to retaliate. He does not touch her. He doesn't hit her. He tells her to calm down. But he's, he's, he's mad. He'll tell you that. He's mad. She broke his PlayStation, hit him over the head, broke his phone. So what does he do? He gets into her ear and he starts telling her, Kyla has a better body than you. She's better looking than you. And this sets her off even more. She storms out of the house. You're going to see on the video that she trips and falls. She had some recent cosmetic surgery, but she pops right back up. He did not touch her. She claims, and she's going to tell you, and has made prior statements, that he picked her up off her feet and slammed her to the ground two times. That's not what you're going to see. You're going to see him backing off, not doing anything as she pounds him and beats him up. He's in her ear, 
saying Kyla has a better body, Kyla's better looking than you, and sh this just enrages her even more and more. You're going to see on the video that she storms back into the house to get her tequila bottle after she's allegedly slammed to the ground two times. She forgot the bottle. So she runs back into the house to get her tequila bottle, goes back out the door, you'll see this on the video, and you're going to see Travis following her and he's still in her ear talking about Kayla and this infuriates her even more that she takes the tequila bottle and hits him over the head with the tequila bottle. At this point, DJ is now coming out and he's involved and he's trying to calm the situation down. And you're going to hear from DJ as well. He will tell you this occurred. She picks up a brick on the, by the front house on the lawn near a palm tree. And she starts heading towards Travis's BMW truck, which was the first big purchase he made when he got his NFL contract. This is his most precious thing. He's no longer in the NFL. He doesn't have any more money. This is his pride and joy. And She takes the brick and she's walking towards the car, the truck, to smash the window. But DJ and Travis stop her and they take the brick from her hand. Okay? That car window mysteriously was smashed that evening, but Dominique says she didn't do it. While she's on the front lawn, acting this way, screaming, yelling, calling him a broke bitch, broke bitch, this is even heard by another neighbor, she, she tells Travis again, repeatedly, I'm going to have my brother come and kill you. And now she says it more, and she's more serious about it. You're going to hear that she had driven her car to the scene, to the Travis's house that night, a black scion, I believe it was, parked it alongside his house. Um, she got into her car. DJ and Travis went back into the house. They, they didn't know what to make of all of this. It was just unbelievable. Uh, you're going to hear that while she sat in her car, she did something that set this entire nightmare into motion. She calls her brother, the one that she said was going to come over and kill him. And she's crying and yelling and upset, tells him what happened. He slammed me to the ground. He disrespected me. I just had a cosmetic surgery. Keyshawn's now all riled up. She calls another friend of hers, a, who Keyshawn sees as a brother, close friend, Tyler Robinson, tells Tyler Robinson, he disrespected me. He t slammed me to the ground two times. Come get him. She then sends a group text, a group text that you will see, to Keyshawn and Tyler Robinson. And she says, go shoot up his shit. Go shoot up his shit. And what does Keyshawn respond back to her and, Ty and Tyler? He responds that Travis Rudolph is a dead man walking. Dead man walking, that's what he says. You're going to hear that Dominique also, in her rage, calls Tierney Coleman. Tierney Coleman is Travis's sister. And she tells her, he disrespected me. I'm going to go handle him. My brother's going to go handle him. I'm going to come to your mama's house. My brother is going to shoot up his shit. She then calls Linda Rudolph and gets in her ear and starts telling her, he, I'm, I'm going to handle him. I'm going to handle him. He disrespected me, and I'm going, to, I'm going to have him shoot Travis. She called everybody. She, she could not control her rage. At 10.15, you're going to hear Tierney Coleman then called Travis's house, the house phone, to warn him, hey, she just called me. She called mom. This, she's, uh, she's unhinged. She's telling everybody that they're coming. They're going to kill you. He was... Travis was concerned, but n not completely 100%, because they had gotten into it in the past, and they were on the outs, and he was leaving in May. She had done this, but, you know, they had fought, they were fighting pretty much all the time. 
10.45, Linda got home from Bible study. And she looked at the ring video and saw that Dominique Jones was the aggressor. She saw with her own eyes that her son did nothing wrong, that she was the one that was pounding and beating up on him. So she knew that Dominique was not being truthful, but she was still concerned. You're going to hear that they spoke about it, but things were quiet for a little bit, so they went to bed. Travis went to bed. BJ was up. Linda was still up. Dominique drove to her apartment in Delray Beach. And when she got there, you're going to hear that Keyshawn, her brother, Jones, was present. She was crying. She was upset. She had no injuries, although Keyshawn will tell you she did. But the detective she met with that nice didn't, night didn't note any injuries. She never went to the hospital. Um, but she put on the show, and she cried, and he slammed her to the ground, and he disrespected her. So what does Keyshawn do? Keyshawn grabs his 9mm Glock that he's known to carry. He has a concealed weapons permit. He's a gun enthusiast. He's bought and sold guns. In fact, he, the gun that Mr. Clossie made reference to that, that Tyler Robinson had that night was sold to Tyler by Keyshawn Jones one day after he had purchased it. He knew how to handle guns. And at that time, he had a 9-millimeter Glock. He took it, and what did he do? He went to his friend Tyler Robinson's house, who had also received the text messages to go shoot up his shit and that, Ty and that uh, Travis was a dead man walking. And what you're going to hear is when he got to Tyler Robinson's house, there were other men that there were there too that Tyler had called and said, come here, we got to do something. We can't let this go. We got to do something about him disrespecting Dominique. And when they got to Tyler's house, Sebastian was already there. Tyler's brother Tyrone was there. Chris Lowe was there. And then Keyshawn shows up. And what did they do? They conspired and planned to go to Travis's house at midnight, several hours after this alleged slamming to the ground to retaliate and to kill him, just as she ordered him to do. Two hours later, that's what the evidence is going to show. They weren't there to help a damsel in distress. She was home back in Delray in the apartment. The threat was over. They were there at midnight to act as vigilantes and to retaliate. That's what they went there for armed. You're going to hear and see that when they went to Travis's house, they took Keyshawn's mother's black Cadillac. You're going to hear that Tyler Robinson was in the front seat. You're going to hear that Chris Lowe and Sebastian were in the back seat. All four men were armed. All four of them had guns, and you'll see evidence of that. They put Travis's GP, uh, address into the GPS, 550T Drive, despite the fact that Keishan had been there on a prior occasion. They put the GPS in. Um, you're going to hear that they intentionally parked several blocks away. They did not park at Travis's house. Travis's house. The men parked down here somewhere. And the reason they did that was it was midnight, dark. They knew that Travis had cameras at the house. They didn't want to give Travis an opportunity to prepare himself for the attack. So they parked the car way down here, <clears throat> never expecting a neighbor, Mr. Nash's camera, to capture that. Never expecting that. And what you're going to hear is when they parked the car way down here from 
that was his house. Despite the fact that there was parking available, they could have parked in Dominique Park. They did it on purpose to come up and do a sneak attack on this man. They didn't want to give him an opportunity to prepare himself and arm himself in case he needed to when four armed men came to his door. You're going to see on the video something very interesting. You're going to see that they park the car, they get out of it, all four men pile out, they open the trunk of the car, and you're going to see Keyshawn Jones put his cell phone in the trunk. He takes his house keys, puts them in the trunk. Sebastian takes his cell phone, iPhone, expensive iPhones, puts it in the trunk, takes his backpack, puts it in the trunk. They put all their personal items in the trunk because they know they're going there for violence. They don't want their property to get destroyed. That's what the evidence is going to show. What do they do then? They pile back into the car, and then they creep up a little bit closer, another block towards Travis's house, but still almost two blocks away. Again, so that he doesn't see them coming, so that they can sneak up at the door, so they can catch him when he's off guard and do what they've been told to do is to go shoot him. That's all on video. If you're only going to talk to someone, why would you do that? Why would you do that? And Keyshawn Jones is going to tell you that that's all he went there for. He wanted to talk. He wanted to have a peaceful chat with Travis, why he disrespected his sister. But he has no good answer why he needed his four brothers to go do that at midnight. Because that was not the intent. The evidence will clearly show he was there to shoot and kill Travis. That's what they were going to do. Ring video. This is when they're at the front door. Keyshawn Jones, Sebastian, Chris Lowe, Tyler. You can see Tyler Robinson has his shirt on when he first comes up. Sebastian just banged on the door and is now walking away. You can see Sebastian's right from pocket, a large <coughs> bulge that is consistent with a firearm, firearm. And you already know from what Mr. Clossy told you that Tyler Robinson had a gun that was found that evening that he ditched, tossed from the police because he didn't want them to find it. But thank God they did.
that Tyler Robinson had. Nine millimeter torus with an extended clip, hollow point with bullets. That's what was found that night. Chris looks, Tyler Robinson had a shirt on when he got there, as you just saw. But before Travis got out and his brother DJ came out, he ripped his shirt off, readying himself for a fight. They kept all their guns in the pockets because they knew there were cameras there. They couldn't pull them out right there. But when they moved the fight further away, they did. And you'll hear about that. You're going to see on the ring video when they got there, Sebastian banged on the door very forcibly. DJ was right there, his bedroom's closest. He came right out, answered the door politely. They'll all tell you that. What do you want? And they demanded to see Travis. We want to see Travis. Get your brother. Now Travis, who was sleeping, hears some commotion at the front door. You're going to hear that he grabbed his gun. He ran to the door. He did not take the gun out. He put the gun by the door and the couch area. He didn't run right out with the gun. He goes to the door. He steps outside. And the minute he stepped outside, you're going to hear that Tyler Robinson sucker punched him on the side of the face. And before he could do anything, all four men were on top of him, immediately attacking him, beating him up. He had no chance. He didn't run back in to get his gun and shoot. They were fighting. It was a big brawl. DJ then got, gets involved. He's trying to pull all four men off his brother. They start then attacking DJ. He doesn't go back in to get his gun. The brawl continues. You're going to hear that the fight continues down the lawn. They're attacking him, beating him up. Sebastian and Tyler are beating up Travis two on one, and you're going to hear from Travis that at that point, Tyler Robinson took out his gun, pointed it at him, threatening to kill him, and said, it's demon time, it's demon time. You disrespected Dominique. It was only at that point that after Tyler Robinson pulled his gun that you're going to hear that Travis Rudolph got his. It was only after he was faced with the gun. You're going to hear he ran back into the house. You're going to see it on the ring video. You're going to see he grabs his gun quickly because it was left at the door, never took it out until he was forced to, to a gun, had a gun on him. You're going to see on the ring video he runs back out with his gun. He trips and falls. He's, in, he's moving so quickly, gets right back up. When he gets back up, he walks back towards Tyler Robinson, the guy that pointed a gun at him. And Tyler Robinson at this point says, you got this, you got this. Now he's scared. Tough Tyler Robinson's scared now. You got this, you got this, as though he's surrendering. And he runs away. He starts running down Redwood in the direction that the car is parked. You're going to hear that at that moment, Travis looked down to follow him, to follow where Tra Tra Tyler was running. And what he saw was that his brother DJ was on the street on Redwood, being attacked by two men. Sebastian and Chris Lowe, two on one, were beating the hell out of DJ. That happened not near the house. <coughs> Nowhere near here. It happened down here closer to where the car was parked. DJ was being attacked, beaten by Sebastian and Chris Lowe. <clears throat> Chris Lowe will even tell you. His story corroborates Travis's and DJ's. Chris Lowe will tell you that when he saw Sebastian and DJ fighting on Redwood, nowhere near the house, that he did not want it to be a fair fight. He did not want DJ and Sebastian to have a fair fight. So what did he do? He ran up and sucker punched him and jumped in. He's going to tell you it was two on one, and that's the way he wanted it. And that's what Travis saw. 
when he looked down the street, he saw two men beating up his brother. And he knew one of them that was running in that direction had a gun. So what did he do? He ran down the street to help his brother. He had his gun on him. And when he got down the street, the four men quickly ran away again, and they ran into the car. What you're going to hear is Sebastian was in the front passenger seat. Keyshawn was driving. Chris Lowe was in the back. Tyler Robinson attempted to get in the car but never really got into it. I'll explain why in a moment. And when they piled into the car, you're going to hear that Travis and his brother were roughly 20, 30 feet away. Sebastian pointed his gun through the windshield that had no tint. He could see it as clear as day and was ready to fire. Tyler Robinson was hanging into the, on the door frame of the back, had his gun pointed at DJ and Travis ready to shoot. And it was only then that two men were pointing their guns at him. It was either him or them, 20 feet away, that he took his gun and he fired in quick succession, 39 rounds. Yes, that's what happened. He struck Sebastian, and the reason he struck Sebastian was Sebastian wasn't ducking. He was sitting upright pointing a gun. That's why he got hit. Keyshawn will tell you he ducked. That's why he wasn't hit. Chris Lowe is going to tell you he ducked. That's why he wasn't hit. Tyler was hit because Tyler was in the doorframe pointing his gun, ready to kill him. And that's why he was hit. Their stories match. The evidence is consistent with that because that's the truth and that's what happened. He had no choice. It was either them or him and his brother. You're going to hear, as I said, that when Chris Lowe tried to get in the car, he either jumped out, fell out, we don't really know, but he never made it in the car. He ran away. He ran several blocks away. I'm sorry, I want to picture that one. You're going to hear that rather than keeping his gun on him, he didn't do anything wrong, right? He ditched it. He didn't want the police to find it, so he tossed it. Thank God for the... Mr. Robinson, excuse me. Mr. Robinson. Oh, hang on. Let me rule on that objection. Um, uh, I want the lawyers up here, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please uh, uh, stand up and stretch. While you're doing so, remember to obey the four cardinal rules. <clears throat> It was not Chris Lowe, it was Tyler Robinson is the one that ditched his gun. I'm sorry, I misspoke. He ditched his gun. He did not want the police to find it, so he tossed it. But a dog found it later that evening. And it was in his path of travel. They were able to find the blood trail, and that's how they found it. After the shooting, DJ and Travis went home. Uh, Linda was crying, Travis was shaken, DJ was shaken, they, they, adrenaline was running, they did not, couldn't wrap their head around what just occurred. You're going to hear that within an hour or so of that happening, Tierney Coleman and her husband, who's an ex-FBI agent, came to the house. And they weren't there for that purpose. They were dropping something off, coincidentally, but of course they walked into this mess. And they spoke about what happened. You're going to hear that DJ was pacing, Linda was shaken, Travis was shaken, everybody was crying, everybody was upset by what happened. They did not call the police, though. You're going to hear that Ms. Coleman and her husband left shortly thereafter. When they were leaving the house, they were stopped by law enforcement officers who were in the area. They were detained. 
They were taken out of their vehicle by, at gunpoint, hands up. They were zip-tied. They were thrown in the back of a police vehicle. Eventually, they were released because they realized they had nothing to do with this. You're going to hear that a, a neighbor across the street, a guy named Ruben Estes, who's lived in this neighborhood for many years, good friends with the Rudolph family. He heard fighting earlier in the evening between Travis and Dominique Jones. He heard Miss Jones calling him a broke bitch over and over and over. Mr. Estes is going to come in and tell you that he also heard the fight and the yelling and the attack later in the evening at midnight. He's going to tell you that it was so scary that he went and got his gun, put a clip in it, because he feared for his own safety, and he was inside his house. That's how bad this was. He'll tell you that at any given moment when he was watching, there were at least two men on top of each of the Rudolph boys. They didn't stand a chance. That's going to be his testimony. What you're going to hear is that after Keyshawn Jones left that area on Redwood, he started heading south towards Del Rey. What you're going to hear is that he drove five miles on US-1, which then turns into Broadway in West Palm Beach. The car was shot. You're going to hear that no time during that five-mile drive did they call 911 while Keyshawn lay beside them shot, bleeding to death. Not once. You're going to hear that during that five-mile drive, they had ample opportunity to toss their guns. That stretch of road is dark. There's a lot of abandoned buildings, closed businesses. It's not a well-lit residential area. This is US-1 turning into Broadway. They ditched their guns, either there or where they eventually ended up. When they got to 40th and Broadway, that's the spot that their car basically died. It ended up in a dark, abandoned automotive shop. You're going to hear from an officer, the first officer on scene, Officer Panagua, that he found something to be very suspicious. When he drove by 40th and Broadway, he saw two silhouettes. And he found it odd that these two people were not flagging him down. He noted that. He rolled up on them, and they never said, hey, help, we need help, we have someone shot. They tried to duck him, and he thought that was strange. You're going to hear Keyshawn did call 911, but not until the car stopped. You're going to hear that he passed the hospital that he was allegedly trying to go to, passed two large hospital signs, when it about four or five blo blocks full city block south of where St. Mary's Hospital was, where he was supposedly going to bring his friend. You're going to hear that this investigation involved roughly 50 police officers at the two scenes, Teak Redwood and then at 40th and Broadway. Of the 50 police officers, roughly, there were sergeants, detectives, law, uh, uh, PBSO deputies, West Palm Beach officers, lieutenants, sergeants, a number of detectives. Not one of those people searched the path of that path of travel that Keyshawn Jones drove for five miles. Never looked for any tossed guns. You're going to hear that while at 40th and Broadway, Keyshawn and Chris Lowe had roughly two hours together to get their story straight before they were interviewed by what would eventually be the lead detective, Vanderlyn. You're going to hear that while on scene at 40th and Broadway, Keyshawn Jones was interviewed first. His interview was 10 minutes long in a homicide investigation. You're going to hear that Detective Vanderlyn was a rookie cop. She had only had one or two homicide investigations done uh, prior to this incident. She was overwhelmed, didn't care, out of her league, Sustained. Sustained. You're going to hear that this was a shoddy investigation. Objection, Sustained. You're going to hear 
during this 10 minute sworn under no oath statement that Keyshawn never told Detective Vanderlyn that Dominique sent him a text messages to go shoot up his shit. You're going to hear that during this 10 minute sworn statement that she took, um, he never told Detective Vanderlyn that he said that Travis was a dead man walking. He left all of that out. What he did tell Detective Vanderlyn was that he and his friends were going over to Travis's to have a talk, and he painted a portrait that this was just a peaceful discussion. He never mentioned to Detective Vanderlyn that anybody had a gun. He never told her that Tyler had a gun. Never mentioned that. At 2.09, Chris Lowe was interviewed, and that was a seven-minute interview. Um, he told, never told Detective Vanderlyn that anybody had a gun. And Detective Vanderlyn had an opportunity to take his cell phone that night and never did and has not to this day because she believes his cell phone is inconsequential to this case and anything contained on it, cell phone logs, text messages, anything has nothing to do with this case. 17-minute investigation. That's what it took, and they arrested him for murder. Sustained. All right. There were, between the two interviews, there was a 17-minute investigation between those two witnesses. And Travis Rudolph was arrested that night. You're going to hear that Chris Lowe gave a subsequent sworn statement a few months later on July 21st of 21. And in that sworn statement, he said, regarding the attack on Dominique. We had to address this. We weren't going to let this slide. We don't call the police. That's not how we operate. Right or wrong, we're helping Keyshawn. That's what brothers do. All four would back each other up to the end of the earth. And he's the one that said when Keyshawn gets mad, he puts on his hoodie, and he said Keyshawn always carries a gun. While on scene at 40th and Broadway, besides all those 50 or so officers and detectives and lieutenants, everybody showing up, you're going to hear that there was a medical examiner investigator that showed up and took a number of photographs and took several photographs of Sebastian's hand. And he must have considered that important for the number of photographs he took. And as you can see, it appeared that something was held in his hand. Finger pointing like that, there's a grip right here. There was nothing in his hand when the ME got there, and you're gonna hear that nobody touched his hand, but it appears that something is, or was, in his hand at some point. You're going to hear from a defense witness, an expert, Dr. John Maracini, Harvard-educated forensic pathologist, former medical examiner, Palm Beach County, former medical examiner, Dade County, that he has handled many, many cases involving suicides and death where somebody was holding a gun in their hand. And he's going to talk to you about something called a death grip and what that means and why it's his opinion that the position of his hand is consistent with Sebastian having held a gun. After Chris Lowe and Keyshawn were excused by Detective Vanderlyn from the scene at 40th and Broadway, you're going to hear that they made a FaceTime call to Dominique Jones and told her Sebastian was dead, and they talked. You're also going to hear that they FaceTimed, that Dominique FaceTimed Keyshawn and Chris Lowe while they were at Tyler's hospital room, which is where they eventually went, and the four of them, Keyshawn, Dominique, Tyler, Chris Lowe, were all FaceTiming in Tyler's hospital room at St. Mary's Hospital before Dominique Jones was interviewed by the police. Detective Emma was sent to St. Mary's Hospital to interview witnesses. 15 minutes, and when he got there, you're going to hear that Dominique Jones was there and he interviewed her. 
He was surprised at how much detail she knew. Dominique Jones never told Detective Emma that she ordered Keyshawn to shoot Travis. She never told Detective Emma that Keyshawn was a dead man walking. She never told him that she broke Travis's phone, hit him over the head with a trophy, or broke his PlayStation, hit him over the head with a te tequila bottle, that she made threats to Tierney and Linda. She never told him anything. She only painted a picture that he was going there to talk to Travis, that her brother was going there. At 3.51 in the morning, Detective e and he doesn't see any bruises or injuries on her either. At 3.51, Detective Ema takes a statement, a sworn statement, just like Dominique's, of Tyler Robinson. Tyler Robinson doesn't tell him that he carried a gun. He never told him that he tossed his gun. He never mentioned anything about a gun. The evidence is going to show that Tyler was just grazed and he was released from the hospital the following day on the 8th. On April 8th, he's now interviewed by the lead detective, Detective Vanderlyn. And he is now confronted with the gun because they found it a few hours earlier. Now he can't lie. Now he has to admit it was his gun because they have it right there. He tells Detective Vanderlyn that he's the one that called everybody to his house to gather up. Vanderlyn, Detective Vanderlyn, tells him at that time that there was a camera outside but doesn't say what it showed. And that's important because when Tyler came to um, the state attorney's office for a sworn statement a couple of months later on June. Sure. Feel free once again to stand up and stretch, ladies and gentlemen, remembering and obeying the four cardinal rules. As I was saying, on June 16th of 2021, um, Tyler was subpoenaed to the state attorney's office. I've already described a little bit about, um, though that was the other statement, I apologize. On the, on the 16th, he comes to the state attorney's office and he spoke to attorneys, myself, the prosecutors were present, a court reporter for about two hours. And he admitted that he owned the 9 millimeter Taurus that Keyshawn Jones had sold it to him. Um, he also uh, did not have a concealed weapons permit at the time, so he was carrying a concealed weapon, uh, which is a felony. Yet to this day, he's never been charged or prosecuted for that crime, which is a serious offense and carries a prison sentence. He told us in deposition that he spoke with uh, Keyshawn and Dominique by FaceTime while at the hospital and told him about Sebastian and that they spoke about it. Um, Chris Lowe came to the hospital room to see him before he was interviewed or spoke to the police and said that Dominique FaceTimed Chris and Keyshawn while he was in the hospital room and that all four had talked before he was interviewed by the police. He said something that's really important during that deposition. He said that Sebastian adamantly told him to bring his gun that night. Sebastian told him to bring his gun that night. And everybody knew it and everybody there at Tyler's house heard it. That's important because none of the other boys told the police that they, there was a gun or that Tyler had a gun. They all lied. During, after that line of questioning, Tyler, remember, now he knows that there was a, a video at the house because Detective Vandalin told him that two months prior. He remembers nothing about what happened at the door because they, he now knows there was a camera there. But after questions about what happened after the attack at the door, he now has a memory again. He said Travis came out shooting, heard his mom telling Travis to stop, he said Travis was having trouble with the gun and he couldn't pull the slide back. 
and Travis was shooting at him while he was running away, and he admitted to tossing the gun. A couple of months later, he was subpoenaed again to give another sworn statement. And what you're going to hear in that statement, he was questioned by Mr. Shiner and prosecutors, and he said he doesn't remember receiving a call or text from Dominique, doesn't know who shot him, doesn't remember giving a tape statement to the police, doesn't remember Keyshawn, Chris, and Sebastian coming to his house to meet. He testified under oath, subject to perjury, that he doesn't remember anything from that night. He doesn't remember taking his gun to Travis, Travis Rudolph's house. Doesn't remember the fight. Doesn't remember who drove the car. Doesn't remember coming to the state attorney's office to give a two-hour deposition. He admitted that he's not on any medication and doesn't know why he couldn't remember anything. He can't remember if he went to Travis's house or not and doesn't remember throwing the gun away. That was his sworn testimony. You're going to also hear that Dominique Jones refused to give police her cell phone, eventually did, 10 or so days later, she did a consent, but by then she had deleted evidence, incriminating evidence. She deleted the text messages to go shoot up his shit. She deleted the text messages that her brother sent that Travis is a dead man walking. She deleted this evidence because it was incriminating and she didn't want the police to have it or this jury to see it. But remember, Keyshawn's phone was in the back of that caddy and that caddy was now in police custody. He could not get his cell phone. It was in police custody. And they found those text messages on his phone. And they found those text messages eventually on Tyler Robinson's phone. And that's how we have them. You're going to hear that when she finally did turn her, police, uh, her phone over to the police 10 or so days later, she didn't turn it in to Detective Vandalin herself. She sent her friend, Paloma Feliciano, she didn't want to be interviewed by police, so she sent her friend there. Very telling. Remember, she was interviewed, Dominique was interviewed about 2.45 in the morning on the 8th, excuse me, on the 7th. At 10 or so the following, that morning, a few hours later, you're going to hear that Dominique um, was doing some searches and she forgot to delete it when she turned her phone over to Detective Anderlin. And that search history was as follows. Stand your ground law in Florida. Self-defense in Florida. Self-defense, stand your ground law. Florida stand your ground law. Prosecuting attorney, Mark Shiner, net worth. Pro bono, which means free, lawyer. JetBlue customer service, pro bono, which means free. Those are the witnesses you're going to hear from. That's what you're going to be asked to rely upon, and that's what you're going to be asked to base your verdict on. You're also going to hear that there were many, many things that Detective Vanderlyn failed to do. As I just said, she didn't get Dominique's phone until the 16th given her ample time to destroy evidence, which is exactly what she did. She never forensically examined Sebastian's phone. Chris Flo's phone to this day has never been seized. She said it was inconsequential. She never had anybody search the path of the Cadillac, never did a search for guns, Sebastian's, Heshawn's, Chris's. She never asked the 50 officers to do any search, although she had all of them at her disposal. She never bothered to speak to Tierney Coleman. She never bothered to speak to Linda Rudolph. She never got a search warrant. Sure. Once again, four cardinal rules. Feel free to stand up and stretch. All right, the objection is sustained. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, you're to disregard that uh, last statement concerning the uh, interview.
never asked Keyshawn why, why he said that Travis was a dead man walking. She never followed up with Keyshawn after finding that out. She never followed up with Dominique about her text to this day. She's had DJ's phone in evidence since April 6th of 2021 and to this day has never forensically examined it. You're going to hear that between the hour, hours of 10.16 p.m. and 1.31 in the morning on April 6th into April 7th, that Tyler Robinson made 29 outgoing calls, texts, and FaceTime calls to Dominique, Keyshawn, Sebastian, Chris Lowe, and some others. Tyler Robinson received 24 incoming calls, texts, FaceTime calls between the hours of 10.16 p.m. and 1.31 p.m. from Dominique, Keyshawn, Chris, and others. These other people included someone by the name of Hack, H-A-C-K, who Tyler Robinson FaceTimed at 11.39 a.m., 20 minutes before the shooting and before the men arrived at Travis's house. And the text from Tyler to Hack says, Travis's address is 550 Teak Drive. We don't know why Hack was going to the house to meet these four armed men or what role he played. Or why Hack was needed at the Rudolph residence to talk for the purpose of talking to Mr. Rudolph. Keyshawn and his armed brothers were not noblemen, they weren't chivalrous. They didn't witness an attack on an innocent woman. They were vigilantes. They were four men who went there to retaliate and kill, just as they were ordered to do. We don't want to plunge you in the darkness. We want the lights on. We want the fag unfolded. That's what we want, and that's what you're going to hear from the defense. Travis Rudolph acted in self-defense, and that is the truth. Thank you.